Okay. Uh, I'm Rebecca Kimmins. I'm a West Virginia University graduate, uh, 1971, journalism. I went to college. The way I got to college was uh, I got a Board of Governors scholarship that made it possible for me to go to school. So uh, I got through school in four years. I knew it was four years or, you know, I was going to be out on my own. So I made dang well sure that I got through in four years. Um, I loved my WVU experience. Uh, it was formative, of course. So we've had many conversations since the bomb was dropped that there's going to be an academic uh, restructuring. And I feel very privileged that I was part of an organization that became a thing called Create West Virginia. And we talked about the creative class and the importance of the creative class to uh, 21st century economies. And we learned about something called adaptive leadership there. And that's uh, saying that when there are situations that call for leadership, leaders emerge. So whether they're part of the authorities or not, you know. Uh, so we have a situation here, I think, where leaders are emerging and things need to be said. We want them to be said. Tonight's session and all these sessions that are forthcoming, the four sessions that are on the planning board right now, are to creatively make suggestions to the Board of Governors about the West Virginia University that we want to see in the future. Uh, we want this to be an, a visioning session for the WVU, a brilliant WVU, uh, that is not just lip service about how world class it's going to be. We want it to be truly world class, and we alum who are gathered here and interested people want to make it so. I'd like to get Dan Page to come over. Um, we're learning as we go here how to do this. Um, I'd like to introduce Dan. Uh, he can tell you far more about him, but he's a very modest gentleman and he's done many amazing things. He was the founding editor in chief of the State Journal. Um, he had that position twice in his career. Um, I'll miss some things, but one of the important things is that he was a Democrat in the position of Cecil Underwood's press secretary. So uh, that's one of the reasons why I called Dan right away. I have enormous respect for his mind. And uh, so I'm going to let him say a few words. Hit a nip right there. See, see that comes up at the I hit a nip. There we go. Okay, Dan. Thanks, Becky. Um, we were classmates in Morgantown, class of 71. We've known each other a while. Uh, the reason I'm here tonight, uh, I want to be a better alumnus. Uh, I did not have time as a parent. Mute, mute. I didn't have time as a parent and a, a working person to uh, monitor every movement of the uh, university, its board of governors. Um, I, uh, like everybody, I've seen what's been going on in Morgantown. I have great respect and love for the university. I want it to be a great university. I think it has served a wonderful purpose in this state. I believe it has uh, a mission that it uh, it's it's valuable to everyone who lives in West Virginia and beyond, frankly. Uh, it, it's, it's a hugely important thing to me. I want to be, as I said, I want to be a better alumnus because I believe we need to have a better dialogue with the people who run Western University. That would be the Board of Governors and the administration. Uh, I'm not here to point fingers and pay a, play a blame game. I'm simply here to try to figure out if there's interest in a way for people like us who are working people who go to work and maybe don't contribute a ton of money to the university. I mean, I wish I could, I don't have a ton of money. But anyway, I, I wanna be one of those people who is involved in talking to them and hearing what they have to say. And I think that's the important thing for me right now. I'll be a better alumnus if I can figure out. Um, I just admit. Just very cool. I just admit. Yeah. Um, I'll try to be a better. I'll do my best to be a better alumnus if we can find a way to speak uh, as a group. Uh, we may not agree on everything. In fact, Becky and I talked about this earlier. We don't agree on everything. Trust me, we do not. <laughs> but I do want to be a part of a, that kind of. Uh, dialogue between the university and the people out here it trained and the people who respect it to this to this day and i'll always respect it i mean 
one of the highlights of my life is showing up at a football game in 1958 at Old Mountaineer Field. I ended up going to school there probably because of that. I know it's an emotional thing for a lot of us, and that's really all I have to say, but that's my purpose for being here. So I, if we can find a way to speak together and open a dialogue with the university, the Board of Governors, the administration, whomever it may be, that's my reason for being here. All right, so um, I'm going to ask you all to come up here so that you can be recorded and say uh, what you came to say here tonight. And once you've spoken, we'd like to limit uh, the initial remarks to four minutes, and I'll keep time. Um, if you exceed four minutes, it uh, looks to me like there'll be plenty of time to come back and, and have this conversation. So. Um, I'll just start going around the room. Betty, do you mind to come up? And I'll introduce you, Betty Rivard. Uh, you may have seen her articles in the Charleston Gazette Mail. She's a, a very active thinker here. I'm happy to have her in the Mountain State. Come on, Betty, move over here. There you go. Uh, thank you. I'm Betty Rivard. I have a master's in uh, elementary education in 1975 and a master's in social work, 1976. Uh, I worked for DHHR for uh, 24 years, retired in 1999, and uh, partway through that time in the 90s, got introduced to the legislature and did some liaison work with them. And after I retired, I ended up um, being involved, uh, mainly as volunteer. I also worked for the House of Delegates for six years in the Senate for part of that time. And, I, and since uh, 2015, I've gone back as an independent volunteer citizen advocate. And uh, I'm from a WV family. My father taught there for uh, 14 years, starting in 1963. My sister has a had a, my late sister had a degree from there. My younger son had a degree and was city editor of the uh, of the Daily Athenaeum the year that they had problems with uh, President Garrison and then worked for the Charleston Daily Mail for um, four and a half years, part of that time as State House reporter. So um, I'm all in. <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate what everyone is doing to come out and try to um, voice an alternative vision. Um, I've been reading a lot the last week or two. and. The national press, from my point of view, it, we're in every every outlet I can find online, and people send me things. I, I'm not clued into social media or um, TV or radio, so I get a lot of my news from national newspapers online and from emails and newsletters. And uh, what really impresses me is that people around the country are really getting what's happening here. And, and it's a much bigger story. It's a story of what's happening in Morgantown, which is a disaster enough for people who are there. But it's also part of a larger movement to um, uh, the, the story I read today really nailed it, basically make the rich richer and the poor poor. <laughs> and we know that that's coming from a lot of different directions. But this is very much part of that agenda. And there are people in our state legislature who represent that agenda and are pursuing it, and obviously are huge players in what's happening right now. And the consultants are also players in that. So um, I I agree with the demands of the students and uh, and the faculty. I think they're very well thought out and and very on target. Um, I'm a cheerleader. I'm trying to provide whatever help I can with strategy. I wrote, had one op-ed published Saturday on this issue. I've submitted another one. I, 30 seconds. I submit weekly op-eds, and most of them are published, but not all of them in the Gazette Mail. And uh, I really like uh, Becky's idea of an alternative vision, and I want to contribute to that. Would you come uh, when you see, uh, you, you're not going to speak? I, I, I would love for you to just come on up. We, let's use our time well, be ready to step up when, when it's time. Hello, my name is Suzanne King, and I am a, a graduate uh, from WVU. I have a BS in business administration with a major in accounting. 
my brother and sister are graduates, my daughter, uh, both my, uh, my nieces. Uh, we could go on and on. I have a lot of family. Um, this is devastating to me because and I, I know my own daughter who's sitting back there is going to be angry when I say this because she doesn't like me to, to put her on a pedestal. But she has an engineering degree from 2014 from WVU. And she got two prestigious national scholarships, the Fulbright Scholarship, which allowed her to study in uh, Madrid for a year. And she was the only the third Marshall Scholar from WVU uh, in 2019. Uh, and that began back in the 1950s, I believe. And they only select 45 a year out of the US. And she, was, she studied. It gave her two master's degrees in the UK, totally, paper everything, room board, housing, transportation, everything. And she would not have gotten this. Her engineering degree was great, don't get me wrong. But she also studied political science, uh, I should say in, uh, international and comparative politics. She had a minor in that, and she studied Spanish. She would not have gotten the Fulbright without studying Spanish. They liked to put her on posters, and they did. And they prayed her around, prayed her picture around. She's gonna be mad at me saying all this, but it, it, it's true. And now they want to cut these programs. That we're gonna lose those opportunities. Now, what I what I think this group needs to do is to tell why we need to make these changes. Why these changes? Why this cannot happen? The why? We can't just say you shouldn't. You shouldn't. I'll give you one, and there are a lot of reasons. But I'll tell you one. I work at a private uh, university. I've been in higher ed for many, many years, and this state has a very, very, very serious problem of drain, brain drain, brain drain. Mm -hmm. I watch kids that my, my daughter went to school, high school with, and they went out of state to go to college and they never came back. Now they're not going to stay at WVU. A lot of them that did go to WVU have chosen to stay. They will leave. We heard one of the politicians say, well, if they don't like what we're doing here in the state, they can leave. That is very short-sighted, and I think that is an important reason that we need to address this. I know some of you have other reasons, but that's one. So I'll just stop at that. Brain drain, we've got to stop the young people from leaving the state. And, and again, I'll emphasize the one thing we, this group has to do is the why, why we can't allow this to happen. Thank you. Robin? Thanks. I'm Robin Godfrey, uh, WVU Law graduate in 1976. I decided to go there when none of the other schools would accept me. <laughs> uh, Betty Regard described it best. This plan, so to speak, is it's being sprung on the students, the faculty, really, uh, is chaotic. It's chaos. Uh, what I'm impressed with. Uh, is the lack of responsibility that anyone in the administration really seems to be taking for this. Truman said the buck stops here, but nobody here is saying, oh, my bad. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's just a total surprise. I'm also impressed, I mean, they, they want to turn our flagship university into a John vote. Uh, I'm also impressed with the lack of advocacy by President Gee. It's outrageous as a lawyer. If you get a DUI, do not hire this guy, okay, to represent you. Uh, he's thrown himself at the feet of uh, uh, Justice Blair and Hanshaw and said, no, nope, we're going we're to solve this at, up here at WVU on the backs of the faculty and students. At this point, I'd rather have Bob Huggins as president of the university. They need to give Guy the gate, by the way, liberal arts education, that's alliteration, rather than a big fat severance package uh, and, and a sinecure, that's Latin, uh, at the law school, as a professor, if you think enrollment is declining now, wait till September 2024. Uh, I was just in New York, and our cab drivers in sequence were from Algeria, Haiti, India, Pakistan, uh, and uh, one other country it escapes me. In a multilingual country, certainly a bilingual country, in a global economy, it's crazy that they're going to eliminate world languages. What, and of course, other students are saying, why am I going here? What's next? And if you're going to do world languages, you're going to do computer science, it, make, it would make as much sense in this uh, day and time. This is a time to drop back 
and not spring this. And it, uh, I think everyone senses this has just been sprung on the state. It's a tremendous black eye for this state, as remarks have been said. This is all over the country, and it, it's just a really dismal time in West Virginia. If this is allowed to go forward, and I hold the Board of Governors made up largely of 10 men, white men, and three women, I hold them responsible as well for what has happened here. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Judy Hamilton. I'm a graduate of the WVU Everly College of Arts and Sciences and the WVU College of Law. I oppose the proposed cuts at WVU and I support the students' call for an independent audit of WVU President Gee and the WVU Board of Governors. I agree with the students and other alumni that it appears that these individuals have mismanaged have mismanaged funding. We have a situation where our um, our Board of Governors and President are proposing to cut programs that are 100% viable and are totally self-sufficient in their funding. They actually bring in more money than the cost of their programs. So it's nonsensical to be cutting them. In the 2021 fiscal year, WVU received a record shattering $203 million in external funding for research and other programs. Even with starvation from the West Virginia governor and the West Virginia legislature, the WVU budget shortfall is likely from mismanagement, not simply declining enrollment. For example, all alumni who visit Morgantown, myself included, have been puzzled in recent years by the development of new buildings, new housing, the rise in number and salaries of administration, and the unnecessary acquisition of property when everyone's been aware of declining enrollment due to increased tuition cost. It's important for all of us to consider that the proposed cuts won't just eliminate positions and external funding, they'll destroy the departments. This may be the true intent behind the drastic cuts. I invite alumni to look at President Gee's membership on the Board of Advisors at the University of Austin and ask themselves if he has WVU and the higher education of West Virginia citizens at heart. While changes are necessary, it's the executive level bloat at WVU that needs to be addressed. What would it take to solve the WVU budget crisis? Cutting administrative payroll back to 2013 levels would completely eliminate the FY 2024 budget deficit cutting it back to 85% of the 2013 levels to match the decline of enrollment would generate savings of $74 million. This would eliminate the entire projected budget deficit for the next five years through the democratic cliff expected to begin in 2016, 2017, I mean 2027. The Department of World Languages, Literature, and Linguistics makes an average annual profit of $800,000. Why is a fiscally viable program that brings acclaim, employment, and economic development opportunities to our state be cut? Why is the MFA in Creative Writing a program that is self-sufficient? Why would it be cut? The same can be said of many of the other WVU programs, including the Business and Economics Communication Department. Why? We have to ask why. It is nonsensical, and we need answers from the Board of Governors. Another factor driving the university's financial gap is declining state legislative support for higher education. If West Virginia lawmakers had kept higher education funding at the same levels as a decade ago, WVU would have an estimated additional $37.6 million in state funding for the coming fiscal year, 
closing most of this year's budget gap. Yet President Gee and the WVU Board of Governors are okay with this. We must all be asking ourselves, why are they okay with this? Since this, 30 seconds. Since the state's financial situation has improved in recent years with the governor and legislature touting a surplus, surplus at the end of the most recent fiscal year, their starvation of WVU's academic programs must be examined and those responsible held accountable at the November 2024 election. Before you cast a vote for any incumbents in 2024, ask them what they did to save WVU and West Virginia students. My name is Debbie Weinstein, and I'm a graduate of the Evergreen State University in Olympia, Washington. Both of my kids are WVU grads. Um, I have nothing to contribute. I think what everyone has said has been brilliant and spot on. I'd love to have your remarks, if you wouldn't mind, to send to my children. I'm not kidding. Let's pass them around. Anyways, um, thank you all. And Becky, thanks for hosting this. Okay. Hi, my name is Susan Johnson Beasy. Um, I am not a WU grad. I'm a West Virginia Tech grad, back when it was Tech, um, back in the old days. Um, my Both of my children are currently at WVU. I have a 21-year-old uh, who has changed her major several times, so I don't really know if she's a junior or a senior or what she is right now. Um, but I also have an incoming freshman. Um, on the day that I moved my freshman into her dorm, um, is the day that they announced the, the cuts. And I can 100% say that had I had this information four months ago, my younger child would not be at WVU. Um, we actually talked her into going to WVU. WVU has everything you need. WVU has a lot of engineering majors. You can study foreign language at WVU. You can, you know, save the money. <laughs> Use the promise, use the Buffalo scholarship, use all the, you know, use all your scholarships, save your money for grad school. Um, my husband and I were, <laughs> I mean, I feel at this point in my life, I feel guilty, you know, that I talked my child into going to what I thought was going to be a great opportunity for her. Um, my older daughter spent the summer in Santander, Spain with, um, with W's Spanish department. And she had a remarkable experience that she calls life-changing. She, um, I can say that she really grew up, um, not only did her fluency increase, but just her understanding of other cultures uh, and, you know, the larger world around her changed. She became more interested in school, more eager to, you know, hurry up and finish an engineering degree so she could go work for a multinational company and use her Spanish skills. I mean, that's an expectation for this generation. You know, um, I only found about the, out about this meeting a couple of hours ago, so I didn't really have time to prepare anything. But I have emailed a gazillion people at WVU <laughs> um, and our governor and our senators. And, you know, I've gotten one response. And that was from um, the WVU uh, provost office and a lower level employee in the provost office with their typical talking points that you've all seen. Um, but you know, the bottom line is 21% of American households currently speak a language other than English as their primary language at home. That's going to continue to increase. Um, you, you know, we live in a global economy. Our kids, that this generation needs to be fluent in another language. And it's not gonna happen with Duolingo or some kind of correspondence course or some kind of online course they're talking about through another school. Like they are going to be missing major, major points of a foreign language education. Um, they have not thought this through. I participated in the parent Zoom last week. It was a joke. They cherry picked the questions that they answered. They didn't, you know, answer what I've heard from other parents was pretty much what we were all asking. They don't have data to support these cuts. 
and they don't have data to support their alternatives. I mean, you know, I asked about what data do you have that, you know, teaching that learning foreign language through an app is comparable <laughs> to an in-person foreign language education. They completely ignored my question. I mean, I've been looking online. I can't find a single, <laughs> a single piece of data that supports that the you know that what they're proposing is is advantageous to, for our kids or even su even remotely supportive of their education. They're not going to get what they need. And uh, I mean, I'm just I'm speaking to foreign language because that's what is impacting my children. Um, you know. <laughs> I'm the oldest, I work for a company based out of Northern California. I'm the oldest person in my department. I'm 50 years old. I'm the only person who's not bilingual. So, you know, just because it hasn't trickled to West Virginia, if we want West Virginia to be competitive, if we want our kids to stay here, like we have to raise the bar, not lower it. And the, this, um, okay. Cause I have some names at WVU that, but I won't move on back. We'll come back around okay. in a minute. All right. All right. Thank you. This gentleman will be next up. I am uh, Joe Mullins. I'm an MFA in uh, sculpture and bronze casting, and I did not get it at WVU. Um, I just want to make a few points. Uh, I'm not here to do an academic rundown. But I want to share some thoughts with you and some information. Number one, I'm 82 years old. When I was about that tall, they passed a penny coat tax to build West Virginia University Medical School. What is the coat tax today? A penny. A penny. So who? How's that? Uh, how's that happen? Well, coat. Uh, Coca-Cola and soft drink people lobby the legislature. Uh, that was 20%. One penny was 20%. What would be 20% on a Coke today? How much money would that raise? Millions and millions and millions of dollars. And it would also cut down on obesity. I can fat shame a little bit here. All right. Number two. Uh, art has been an integral part of the human race for 35 years thousand years and suddenly uh, the snake oil salesman up there doesn't believe it's important let me point out a couple other things when they get through uh, with the amputations up there I want to remind them that 30 percent of the state's population lives closer to a high university I mean to University of Kentucky then they live to Morgantown, and they're getting in-state tuition. 50% of the state's population lives closer to Ohio University than they live to Morgantown. Why would anybody drive over those mountains in the winter when they could go to OU and get an MFA like mine? All right. Now, Gordon Gee has been selling us snake oil for a decade. And it obviously hasn't cured our problem. He now is suggesting amputation, which is not going to solve the problem. Uh, it is time for him to go and anybody else associated with this harebrained idea. And um, I think that is my uh, total. Uh, uh, oh, well, I will, I will uh, end with that. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kate Long, and uh, I'm a 1968 graduate of WVU. And uh, I got an English degree. And since then, I've been a journalist and an artist. And one of the things they're doing, uh, the crazy stuff they're doing up there, is combining the journalism school with the creative arts school. Now, I can tell you from experience that artists create things, and journalists stick to what happened. 
I don't know how that's going to work, but these people just don't even think about things like that. They're just, it's like they're randomly wrecking the place. Um, I think about this out of state company that uh, recommended the cuts. Who are these people? And why did they send this out of state? I can just see them sitting there thinking, oh, West Virginia, what do the hillbillies don't need? Well, they don't know what do they need languages for. What do they need art for? What do they need jazz music for? Uh, we should be making these decisions here. And there's some dates that people need to keep in mind, which is September 15th, they're going to make these decisions, the Board of Governors. And they're going to make decisions that are going to be very hard to reverse. Because once you've destroyed a program that's been built up over decades, it is very hard to build it back up. Uh, somebody else may have this date. I didn't realize, think I was going to speak, but or I would have gotten this date. There's a vote of confidence from the faculty uh, for Gordon Gee and the administration. They need 700 faculty to be there to make this vote count. And so one thing that people can do, because we need to buy time. I applaud uh, Becky's idea of create, thinking of a, a better WVU. And, you know, what do we want? Not what does some out-of-state company want. But if they destroy the place and destroy these programs, they're done. And building them back up is will be a whole lot harder than if that was, than if uh, we get some time. We need time to think about these things. We need the questions answered, like why did they build all these apartment buildings uh, up there that are empty now? That I hear WVU is having to pay the rent on some of them. You know, you hear a lot of things. Is this true? What about all these medical facilities that are being built with the WVU name on it? What impact does that have on the entire budget? There are too many questions out there and we need time. We need time to have these questions answered. Uh, you know, I think about, <laughs> this is probably not a good comparison, but Ukraine. Now, there, the cities are being destroyed. In our case, Program, you know, programs are going to be destroyed. Once something is destroyed, it is really hard to build it back. Right now, September 15th is the date, along with the date of the no confidence. Um, if you know faculty up there, tell them get 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 over there and uh, go, and you, they can zoom into that meeting and uh, and vote no confidence for this administration. Uh, I, you know, uh, with, they're making West Virginia a, a sort of a laughing stock for the rest of the country. And uh, the way that we say that is to say no. On September the 9th, uh, before the football game, there will be a big demonstration and a big effort to get the alums up there. And this will be a come up there and yell at them kind of thing, you know. Uh, uh, and the basic point is, as long as Gee is there, we're not giving you our money. You know, I'm a single person without any kids, and I had been thinking about maybe endowing some scholarships up there, you know, in, in my will. I'm not giving them any money as long as they're mismanaging the place as badly as they are. Uh, I, I wrote to him and told him I'd give it to Marshall instead. And, uh, and I sent it to about 20 people and I heard back from one person. And that person said, don't blame me. I'm, I agree with you. <laughs> so, so that's, you know, uh, we've got, before we can uh, talk about what could be better, we kind of save the, you know, the place from being wrapped. And uh, so come up on the ninth. Uh, if you know any teachers, tell them to take part in that vote of vote of confidence of no confidence, uh, and um, hope that we arrive on, se on September fifteenth uh, without a, um, a destruction of some programs. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
I'm Renata Poor, and uh, I agree with all the eloquent speakers here. They've put the questions out there. We need those questions answered. At the very least, there should be a dialogue uh, among the higher education, government, and the people of this state. West Virginia University is too precious to dismantle it. We want economic development. Where do you see economic development? Around Morgantown. We want people to come in. We want more diversity. Well, maybe not all of us, but I certainly do. Uh, where is that? It's in Morgantown. It's a precious, precious thing for West Virginia. And this attempt to break it, to tear it down is needs to be um, protested big time. So I just want to tell you, since everybody has already said everything, um, myself, I am a graduate of WVU with a doctorate uh, in history. And uh, when I got a doctorate in history, I had to be proficient in two other languages in order to do research in European history. So I studied French and German in order to get the PhD. Who's going to, how are you going to, how's that going to work now? So, um, foreign languages, diverse people is what makes a university exciting. It's what makes people learn. It's what makes people reach out into the world instead of, you know, collapsing in on themselves. So this, this needs to be protested. We need a dialogue, $45 million. You may think that's a lot of money, but I've been around state government, and Betty and some of you have, that's nothing. That's nothing, as somebody said, you know, a, a tax on soda pop, which we have tried for many years to get, could easily solve this problem. The governor just gave 45 million to Marshall for a new building. <laughs> it's not the money, folks. It's something, I don't wanna, I'm not a conspiracy kind of person, but it's pretty sinister, the, the, the thing they're doing without the consent of the people. Thank you. One more thing I, one more thing I wanna say. WVU, I have uh, had the fortune. I'm a graduate of UCLA with a bachelor's degree. I went to Oklahoma University, got a master's degree, PhD at WVU. I was a Fulbright scholar studying in Germany at, the, uh, at a German university. And uh, then I went to North Carolina, University of North Carolina to get a master's in public health. And I want to tell you that the instruction I received at WVU was as good or better than any of the universities I attended. So let's save WVU. I'll be real quick. Um, I wasn't going to speak, but y'all just got me motivated. I'm a secondary education graduate from, at WVU, and my sisters and my, a lot of my cousins went there. I graduated in 76 for my education and master's degree in 78 as a for reading. And I became a high school librarian or all level librarian. And I know what cuts are like. About three or four times they cut libraries. And I won't mention schools. One school, two schools gave away all their books and they're all met media centers. And it was over, over my, you know, the little sign above my door when I went to this one school media center and I put library on top of it. So I know what it's like. Just one quick story. My old roommate, her cousin was in charge of the, uh, I think it was the early learning center or whatever, and uh, really prestigious under WVU. And she, for many years, made it successful. And then a friend of hers said, be, be weary, they're making cuts, you know, in your programs. They call you to the department head who says, you're rift, is the term they used. And you have until one o'clock to go back, get your stuff, be out of there in your office and don't come back. That is exactly what they did. And I just think that's horrific. And I think that's all. But let's hope for the best, I guess. Go Mountaineers, beat Pitt and Penn State. Is there anyone here in the room that hasn't had an opportunity to speak yet who wants to say? Um, well, I would just like to say that this building that we're standing in right now is the result of brilliant revisioning. Many people said that the library is obsolete. You don't need a library anymore. Everybody's got Google. 
What are you going to spend money on a new library for? I'm glad that wiser voices prevailed. And if you have not visited the Kanawha County Public Library in downtown Charleston, it's like a tourist attraction. It's absolutely fabulous. It's beautiful. The architects that put this building together uh, had a brilliant vision for it. They used the architectural elements of the old building. So this to me is proof that we can revision, that we can take something and make it brilliant. All of us here want a brilliant WVU. We don't want a pedestrian so-so WVU. If they're going to have a, an academic transformation, then let's transform it into something that everybody in the United States is aware of and proud of. And it can be done because the alums of West Virginia University are brilliant. There are brilliant people among us. They have wonderful ideas. We want to tap those ideas and make them real. So, um, is there anyone out there in Zoom land that would like to speak? Yes, uh, I would like to say, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is Jim McJunkin. Uh, I don't want to jump ahead of anybody else, but uh, can I, may I speak now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I am a uh, retired pediatrician, but I'm a 77 graduate of WVU Medical School, uh, which allowed me to uh, go further in my training to Philadelphia and Boston and work in Boston Children's before coming home to be chair of the Charleston WVU uh, Pediatrics Program at CMC in 1987. Uh, we came home to West Virginia to raise our children with their cousins. My mom had 10 grandchildren, 10 grandchildren. They all have left West Virginia. None have come back. My daughter is a scientist running her own lab at NIH, and she received a presidential award as a young scientist in recent years. My son is an otologist doing cochlear implants, restoring people's hearing. I would love for my children or any of their cousins to come back to West Virginia, but this is such discouraging news. My daughter would not have uh, been able to uh, do, I don't think, uh, what she did in science if she hadn't had command of the French language, which allowed her to do some of her training in France and work with a woman scientist in her lab and have a role model uh, there. The loss of language program seems very serious. The change in the quality of WVU, I don't think my daughter would consider this a place she could come back to. Uh, the loss of, uh, I believe there's a loss of graduate math programs. How do you excel in physics if you don't have high level math, I would ask. So um, these, these are uh, my concerns and I, I respect so much the previous speakers. Uh, I can't tell you enough how much I appreciate all their input. Thank you. Thank you for speaking. I appreciate it very much, Dr. McJunkin. So everyone tonight here has spoken who chooses to speak. I would like to introduce Morgan King. Uh, she's on the board of Create West Virginia, and uh, she's been very busy tonight making notes and making sure that we have captured all this. Uh, and I want her to cap the meeting tonight with her comments. So she's making her way up here. And uh, she's, Matt, yes. Uh, this year had some really important information I think we should share. Oh, okay, well, we uh, will yeah. then. Yes, uh, indeed. I have one other comment too. Okay, well then I'm gonna save you, Morgan, until the very end. Okay. All right, um, okay. we've got this building until 7.30 tonight and it's only 6.47. So we can have as much conversation here as we want. As, and so, yes, come back and, <laughs> and, and finish your comments, please. Uh, and you had Contacts for the board of governors. I think they want to discuss. Mine, mine will be quick. Okay, we'll let Judy, since she's here, uh, but be ready. Yeah. So many uh, 
of the speakers have talked about how it's been a life-changing experience for their children with uh, various scholarship opportunities that they've had at West Virginia University. My daughter was a National Merit Scholar and she had offers across the country, but she chose West Virginia University because she loves West Virginia and she loves WVU. She obtained her bachelor's in history and English. She has a master's in literary and cultural studies from WVU, a program that has uh, been recommended for elimination. And she just received her MFA in creative writing in May, another program slated to be removed. She has done nothing but bring honor to West Virginia and the university. And it feels like a slap in the face that these programs are being eliminated. And uh, I just want to read something that's on the WVU uh, page that everybody is proud of. West Virginia University recipients uh, of prestigious scholarships include 25 Rhodes Scholars, 26 Truman Scholars, 47 Goldwater Scholars, 108 Gilman Scholars, 77 Fulbright Scholars, 30 Boren Scholars, 39 critical language scholars, and the list goes on. These proposed cuts will eliminate our students from even being able to apply for any of these scholarships. Is that what we want for West Virginia? Do we want another reason for our best and brightest West Virginia children to leave and be forced to go to another college or university? I don't think so. And if that is the intention of our West Virginia legislature, Governor Jim Justice, the Board of Governors at West Virginia University, and President Gee, um, I think that one of the speakers used the word sinister. And I can't help but think, unless they can explain this to me, there is something sinister behind these proposals. And we need time like one of the other speakers said, we need time to get answers. And if they, WVU Board of Governors, insist on keeping a September 15th deadline, uh, that is unreasonable. And I don't think West Virginia alumni will stand for that. And so please call your legislators, call the governor's office, and stop these horrible proposals from happening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan and Becky, for making and West Virginia, Create West Virginia, and Morgan King for, for this. West Virginians need this forum, and thank you. Uh, just one last quick point. Um, I'm not going to read WV's mission statement. You know, you go to the website, pull it up. It's everything we're talking about this is counter this mission you know everything they're proposing is counter to this mission statement but um when i attended the parents zoom last week which i've already kind of alluded to um mark gavin who is an associate provost stated that students don't want foreign language education um their solution is they're going to eliminate the foreign language requirement in most of the ba programs and that way students will have more opportunity to choose what classes they want. Um, and, and, and he was dead serious about this. Um, according to his numbers, there are 24 faculty in the World Languages Department um, that teach 72 students in majors. Kids don't go to WVU for foreign language. That's what they said. Kids, because there are only 72 in majors. So they didn't count double majors and they didn't count minors. And they've yet to speak to minors at all. How many kids are minoring in a foreign language? There are plenty of kids who want to become fluent in a foreign language or who need to become fluent in a foreign language who aren't majoring in foreign language. So the fact that they're, they're saying kids don't come to WVU for foreign language, I absolutely disagree with that because I think kids will leave WVU or not come to WVU for the lack of the ability to study foreign language. So um, that's that's really all I wanted to add. To my previous comment. This is not a speech. This is a contact. If you want to write to the Board of Governors, uh, it's interesting. No, I didn't get in front of it. 
It's interesting that uh, the Board of Governors, there's no phone number, no email for any members of the Board of Governors. So you can send your remarks uh, for all the good it will do to, uh, I'm going to give you the address now uh, from their site. It's Valerie.Lopez, L-O-P-E-Z, at mail.wvu.edu. Just FYI, I had contacted him and never spoke to him in two weeks. That doesn't surprise me. Great. It's so Valerie, V A L E R I E, dot Lopez at mail dot WVU dot EDU. And I will try to find contacts actually for the members of the uh, Board of Governors and put those up. By the way, when I said there were 10 men and three women, I want to clarify there are also two faculty reps, a staff rep, and a student rep. And I figure, uh, he does not listen to them, yeah, right? We can all agree on that, right? Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I don't have my computer with me, it's being used for this, but uh, I wanted to let people know that the faculty has put together some really amazing statistics that they got from the Higher Education uh, Commission and other things that show that the number of administrators has zoomed up exponentially. Highly paid administrators who are averaging about 79000 a apiece, uh, average. Uh, and, uh, uh, it's much higher than that. Yeah, I it's think it no, probably is system. higher it's than that. Higher. But uh, in any case, the number of administrators has zoomed up exponentially while the number of students has been decreasing. And the faculty, uh, can, if somebody could look this up on their computer, there's a, a, a WordPress um, uh, site that's excellent that lists the, actually the, uh, the uh, administrators and their salaries and uh, the uh, declining enrollment. And uh, their suggestion is let's start with the people who are responsible, you know, and let's eliminate some of these administrators until we get this, uh, because replacing administrators is a whole lot easier than replacing programs that once you destroy them. Forum so. 990 will tell that. Forum 990, that they have to all not perform. Forum 990? That's, oh, this that's is the, the website for them to see there. those statistics. Okay, WVU facts dot wordpress dot com wvu facts dot wordpress dot com uh, it's excellent uh, and remember september the 9th come and make a noise yes, where? Uh, it's going to be at, before the football game oh, and so and be. we'll have a lot of publicity about it beforehand right. but plan on it get people to come thanks a lot <laughs> oh, there he is. thank you hey, where is this event going to be uh, at the near, well, they're deciding now, but uh, probably on the old campus about one o'clock. In the free speech zone at the yeah. mountain layer? Yeah. Outside the mountain layer? Yeah. Probably. Yeah. So I have a couple questions and a, I mean, a couple statements and a question. Um, my undergraduate education was at Berkeley and uh, Barner College. And when I ended up going back to W, going back to school, and getting a master's in social work, one of the really key elements for me was networking, even more than the uh, education in class. And I and I'm watching that with my younger son, um, who's you know moved uh, along in his profession in journalism, and uh, still has close relationships with people that he came up with. So I, th I think when we talk about sending kids out of state, um, that's a consideration that we need to think about. And the other thing is a lot of kids can't afford to go out of state. And so we're really, when I talk about making the rich richer and the poor poorer, we're, we're closing doors on kids with lower incomes and a lot of minorities who are in that category. And I think we need to be really protective of that part of our population. Um, second, I'm just gonna mention my, my my older son went to UCLA, and uh, he had to have one class before he went, and and he had to go up to WVU for a summer short course, and it was Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the third thing is a question: 
the way I understood this would operate is that we would be visioning, and um, I haven't really seen us do that. And so what I'm wondering, and, and Morgan, may, you may have a plan that, that will address this, but I'm wondering if there's a way to create a virtual platform where we could do that over the next few days and submit um, submit ideas and maybe even have an interactive function with that. I think that's a great thing. Debbie's going to come back up and say a few words in a minute, but I would like to say that, yes, it's very hard. You know, I think people have so much emotion around this that they need to say what they need to say before they can start talking about visions. So, yes, I think we will create a platform for people to write their visions. When you write something down, it becomes real and you, you can shape it and, and make it real then. And createwestvirginia.org, uh, I'm sure, will make a place for that to happen. So, Debbie, come up and speak. Yes, yeah, I have a, a sheet here for people to sign. Make sure you sign it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, from my experience at the legislature, I think it would be really helpful if we could have a presence there during interims, which are uh, September 10th through 13th, and uh, maybe have like a press conference on the Capitol steps at two o'clock on Sunday. I'm not really uh, the best person to pull that together, so I just want to put that out there and see if anybody else. You know, you don't, don't have to raise your hand now, but um, I want I want to see that idea, and hopefully, since we're local, maybe um, someone could step forward, and I'd be happy to help. Thank you. This is just a couple of questions, and I have no idea what the answers are. How is Marshall doing financially? Does anybody know? Marshall made, Marshall made a plan. Um, about 10 years ago, um, had, went through a, a, a comprehensive planning process. I heard a presentation at the at Play Center on it where they were um, trying to get their finances in order so that they could go forward without spending on any state money. Wow. And I don't know how that's worked, but I read today that their uh, enrollment is also declining. And then, of course, we just went through the situation with the legislature giving them 45,000, 45 million for a new program. You know, one thing I remember is that back when COVID hit, Marshall knew that their numbers were going to drop, and they did an across the board uh, pay cut for people above a certain amount. Why is that not even being discussed here? Right. But uh, I just, I have a friend at Marshall, and I asked if she was going to a certain conference just today, and she says, well, I don't know if they're going to pay for it. So I, I work at a private school, right? And when things got bad, we cut travel, we cut things like that. We right. did not cut. Them. So why are they not doing some of these things? So I don't know the answer to Marshall, but I do know that they have done that in the past. They have a they have a business executive running. He understands financial statements. He understands business decision making. Obviously, he does not. Well, and the, and the thing is. Brad Smith is not just a businessman. Oh, he is a brilliant futurist. So that's why he's there. This is what we need at WVU, a brilliant futurist. They're not a dime a dozen, but they can be had. And my guess is that there's somebody within the WVU alumni uh, organization, not organization, not the actual organization, but the WVU alumni, Maybe that person's out there. Go ahead, Dan. Okay, next question. Has anybody reached out or heard anything from Shelley Moore Capito and Manson? A peak? Silence. No. Uh, Moore Capito's uh, husband is on the board of Ringo. Ringo. Yeah. 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 Charles Capito is on the board of governors. He is one of the people approving these cuts. And that's Shelley Moore Capito's husband. Uh, which I think is really treacherous wow. since their son is running for governor. Wow. I, mean, I just wonder what the politics are around that. Well, I don't know that. He's running for governor. The board captain is the back. Is this one more? And if I get someone from Huntington, you know, um, Carol Miller's son, I think it's really dangerous to get into a pissy match with Marshall or any other school. We need to be standing together because this is coming for everybody. Yes, we need 
uh, all, all the uh, higher education, secondary education teachers need to stand together. You know, we, we are allies, we're not enemies. And Joe, please come back. Uh, the woman sitting next to him. One, so we have to understand the society we're living in. The highest paid public employee in every state, well, in every state but one in the United States is a football coach. I'll say it again. The highest paid public employee in all but one state in the United States is a football coach. And in that state, it's the hockey coach, New Hampshire. Uh, so we are, we're really uh, swimming upstream here uh, with, with, you know, this sort of thing. All right. Before Morgan caps this meeting tonight, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. People come in here talking face to face tonight. We're going to have three more meetings at this point that are on, on the drawing board. Tomorrow night we're going to Wheeling. We'll be at the Wheeling, uh, Ohio County Public Library starting at 6 o'clock. Uh, the following night, Thursday night, we're going to be in Martinsburg at the Martinsburg Public Library. That meeting will start at 5.30 because their library doors close uh, at 7.30. We have to be out of there by 7.30. So if you know people in Martinsburg and Wheeling, then tell them to come out tomorrow night and the night after. We're planning the meeting in Morgantown. We're looking for a location to do that right now. We're going to do this very same thing again. It's been very important, everything that's been said tonight. Now, I want to introduce Morgan King. We're very fortunate that she has come back to West Virginia. She's on the board of directors for createwv.org. And I'm going to ask her to close out the meeting tonight. Do one question before I... Um, yes. Will the people here be able to zoom into those other meetings? Certainly. I mean... The Zoom, uh, everybody, anybody can join these meetings on Zoom. So, yes, certainly, if you want to. It's, you know, the reason why this Zoom component is here is so that people can attend. Will you send the Zoom link to us? Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. Morgan. Yeah. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Um, I won't take long, so I know we've been sitting here for a while, but... Uh, my name is Morgan King, and I was born and raised in Charleston, West Virginia, and um, growing up, I saw WVU everywhere. I think a lot of us did. You know, you see people with their hats, like we see in this very room. We see the flying WV um, all over our state because it's not just a representation of a single city or a single university. It's a representation of our entire state. That's why the university was created as a land-grant institution. And so growing up, when it came time to go to high school, think about going to college. The only place I had in mind was WVU. That's the only place I applied. I had dreams of, I'm going to go someplace else. I'm going to apply out of state. But that was just, one, not financially feasible, and two, a barrier that I was just not able to address. And so I admittedly um, thought, OK, I'll go to WVU. And I went up there and toured. and. Um, after the tour, I was just completely moved that I want to go there. Because in high school, if you ask me what my favorite subjects are, and, and I was a nerd, I, I love school, I did quite well in high school, um, I would say my favorite subjects are Spanish and math. And so um, I knew I wanted to go to school to study um, political science, international relations, along with a major of, of engineering. And when I was looking at other schools across the country, even knowing I wasn't really going to be able to apply, um, the admissions folks there would say, well, no, you have to choose one. Like, if you're an engineer, you don't go to the political science department. Like, those are two different schools. Um, but at WVU, when I said, I want to study Spanish, I want to take political science classes, they said, absolutely. These are like, interdisciplinary experiences. You'll be able to study what you want, um, and it'll make you um, a stronger student. And at that moment, I was sold. I want to go to WVU. I, Went there, I studied civil engineering, graduated in 2018, and got a minor in political science. Um, and throughout my education, I took many Spanish classes. I was shy, I think, a class of a minor, um, and many dance classes. I grew up dancing, and, and I just love the arts. I think you can't be a strong problem solver, a strong critical thinker, um, if you don't, you're not able to think creatively. And I think dance offered me that. I think language offered me that. It helped me communicate. It taught me how to public speak and, and think through 
issues in real time because when you're translating in your brain in real time, your, your brain is working faster than whenever I would be solving a problem set in engineering. Um, and so um, those subjects, the arts and, and language, made me a stronger engineer. Um, and so after school, I, I was fortunate to win a Fulbright scholarship abroad thanks to my language classes. I studied um, my master's education um, both in engineering and public policy, drawing on my political science background, drawing on my engineering background um, through these scholarships. And had I not had those interdisciplinary education opportunities at WVU, I never would have, have achieved and been able to have the privileged opportunities that I've had in a, a free graduate school and seeing the world. Um, and so um, that's really my why. I know we've talked a lot about our why, but I think um, my mother said it earlier, our why is important. Um, we, we've got to know our why if we want to know our how and our what. And um, I really appreciate you all talking about your all's why today. Um, and I just want to touch briefly um, on some of the what's and some of the how's that I'd love to see in the conversations in the coming weeks. Um, because this budgetary crisis is, is a big deal, but there's also a lot of different solutions that can be drawn from before we go and fire some critical staff and uproot the lives of our students. Um, and we can't just do an, all of it in one, one solution. There's a lot of different ways that we can look at. But the first and primary goal is we've got to pause this. We've got to, like, the vote cannot happen in a week. There's no way that we can um, assess the impact of this in, in just a week and a half. The fact that this was announced the day that freshmen were moving in, that is um, deeply concerning. Um, and so, you know, after pausing this and we're thinking about visioning what will this look like, how will we find these funding and also save these critical programs, there's a number of ways that we should be looking at this financial mismanagement. Um, it's been said before, there needs to be an internal um, audit that is transparent to understand how this money was mismanaged. We need to get accurate data on how many students are utilizing these programs. Um, as it was said before, the count of students that are in programs is, is frankly disinformation because if they're only counting first majors, they're not counting second or third majors, they're not counting minors, and they weren't counting people like me when I was in school who took certain classes to allow me to uh, have opportunities after college. Um, so that alone is just misleading, and, and that data needs to be transparent. It also needs to be inclusive, working with our faculty at the university. I mean, it's wild to me that um, this, this task was consulted out to um, a, a a consultant that's out of state, and it was $875,000 for just a few months of work, when we are the flagship land-grant institution in our state. We have so much expertise. People that are academics, they are, they are trained in how to collect data, how to analyze data, and how to interpret what to do with that data to come up with creative and innovative solutions for the future. And why are we not doing that in-house? Why are not we not drawing on the expertise of, of the faculty that the school has? I'd like to know that. Um, so just looking at, you know, we need audits, we need transparency, and we need inclusion in that process. So that's the first main thing I'd like to see after this vote is stalled. Beyond that, I'd like to explore innovative solutions of how we can draw um, new funds. I, I've heard it time and time again. I've been told, well, the athletics department, that's separate from academics. They're two different things. They're self-sufficient. That they're self-sufficient. And, and it is partially true, but it's not entirely true. Since history, like since historically, um, students have paid a fee that goes to the athletics department. Again, it's a fraction of what the total budget is, but it is still a fee. Um, going back a decade ago, it was about a total of $5 million. Again, $5 million out of the total $45 million budget crisis, that's, again, just a small piece of the puzzle. But historically, our students have been supporting athletics over time. Why can't, for a period of time while the university gets back on its feet, athletics support students in the portion of the fees? Um, it, this is also not unprecedented. There's been reports in the Higher Chronicle of Education showing that other land grant institutions like Purdue, like UT Austin, have done this, where athletics have actually supported academics because they realized that after all students or athletes are students first that's why they come to college to play their sport is to get their degree so beyond 
as I said first, the, the audits, the inclusion, the transparency in the process, then drawing from athletics, looking at new innovative ways of how we can draw on those funds, whether it be taking a, a fraction of ticket sales and directing it to ath academics or whether it's uh, giving back the student fees over time for a period of time, there's a lot of options out there and they need to be explored because it doesn't seem to me that they have been. Um, and finally, the last thing I'd like to see is, um, is I'd like to see, and it's been said before, um, cuts at the higher level. We heard it time and time again, there's administrative bloat. We have seen other universities cut their administrative bloat. I'd like to see Gordon Gee either step down or donate his salary um, to this cause. I'd like to see um, folks that make over 200K receive a significant percentage chunk of their salary um, that could account for the $7 million of staff cuts. Um, so with that, I'm really excited to hear what folks' ideas are throughout the state and how we can envision a better WVU together. If you haven't signed this paper tonight, please do sign it. Tomorrow night, we'll see you in Wheeling. Please let everybody you know that lives in the Upper Ohio Valley know about this meeting. Attend either in person, which is wonderful, or by Zoom. Thank you. Good night.